Um, good morning, everyone. Um, exciting to be here, although I don't see many of you here. It's so dark uh, from, from this side, so, so bear with us here. We might light it up when we, uh, when we do Q&A. Um, we, we have a, a very exciting panel today, um, and, and also in preparing for this panel, I think this will be uh, uh, quite fascinating, uh, what, uh, what the panelists bring today. Um, today we have with us um, uh, uh, first Pen, uh, Pat Vincent Cologne. Uh, she's chairman, president, and chief executive officer of PM Resources. She is also a chair, current chairman of EEI, and her two big topics are uh, diversity and smart cities. And hopefully we'll talk a little bit about how do these two uh, intertwine as well uh, today. So, Pat, thank you. Uh, next to Pat, we have uh, Steve Callahan. Steve is vice president, uh, global strategy and solutions um, for energy and utilities at IBM. And um, next to me, uh, we have Hilary Flynn, who was uh, kindly enough to, uh, to represent National Grid on this panel. Um, uh, the previous panelist, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, got sick. But uh, Hilary is director of group technology at National Grid. So thanks to the panelists to be here. Um, I will do a brief introduction, then we'll go into Q&A. Um, we'll do a, fire, a, a quick fire uh, Q&A here. We'll also take questions uh, from the audience, so please feel free to use the app, uh, and then I will call Dylan, and hopefully this time he has a microphone uh, for, uh, to... Uh, you got it, Dylan? To, uh, <laughs> to uh, get some questions from the, from the audience. Um, just to kick it off, by 2030, uh, 5 billion people uh, in the world will live in cities. Um, and uh, the convergence of energy and city innovation will be vital to create uh, communities that are um, uh, sustainable, uh, uh, low carbon, uh, and at the same time providing value to citizens and improve quality of life. Um, that's the topic for the session today. Now, with that being said, uh, in the preparation as well, we also have to talk about uh, communities that are not part of big cities, uh, including rural areas and how energy and uh, uh, energy infrastructure and innovation uh, uh, will support um, uh, people in those areas as well. So we'll touch, we'll touch on that. Um, development of smart cities and the energy transformation have a lot of things in common. Uh, it's driven by uh, customer needs, changing customer needs. Uh, customers want different things with regard to energy. Uh, they want to produce their own energy. They want clean energy. Uh, they want to use power uh, to uh, drive their cars, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also have uh, technology innovation coming in at a rapid speed. Um, what was viable two years ago uh, from a technology perspective, um, uh, what, what, was, what was not viable two years ago from a technology perspective um, is viable today. Uh, and we'll talk about some of those uh, examples as well. And then we have policy and regulation really trying to play catch up with regard to changing customer needs and, and, and technologies. Um, broad uh, area of, 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 of discussion today, but there's five uh, main themes that are helping uh, drive progress with regard to smart cities and the energy uh, uh, infrastructure transformation. One is the shift to renewable energy, uh, both central uh, large-scale uh, renewables as well as distributed generation. Um, uh, uh, solar uh, is, is definitely one theme. Um, Improving the grid uh, so that it actually can support distribution and resources coming in at a faster pace than central station generation. Uh, from our research, um, distribution and resources will grow eight times faster over the next 10 years uh, compared to central station generation. And that's, that's kind of mind-blowing if you think about that. So if you add up all new um, central station generation, you take out the retirements, uh, that is eight times smaller uh, for the next 10 years in terms of growth compared to distribution and resource. There's a lot of distribution and resource coming onto the grid. Uh, distribution generation, storage, uh, energy efficiency, demand response, electric, electric vehicles, etc., cetera, um, is coming in at a rapid, rapid pace. Um, energy efficiency and buildings, and how do we integrate buildings, um, is very important with regard to, to smart cities. Uh, resiliency, and we're not going to talk much about resiliency, but we have to develop energy infrastructures and cities that are more resilient. Um, the pace of uh, uh, events, uh, and whether it's natural um, uh, nature events or whether it's cyber uh, attacks like, like Tom Fanning was talking about, those events will continue to increase and have a bigger impact uh, and also a bigger cost. So we need to make it more resilient. Um, 
local energy markets. Um, there's a lot of uh, challenges right now in some of the uh, energy markets in, in the US. Um, uh, uh, generators are, are struggling in terms of keeping their uh, generation plants open. We need them uh, uh, at, at this point in time. So how do we create local energy markets um, at the local level that actually work for all the participants? Um, there's a lot of in, in, interdependencies between cities and um, uh, infrastructure, energy infrastructure. Um, we see new platforms uh, arising at the edge of the grid around transportation, around buildings, around distribution and resources. Um, and, and we believe, and we just wrote a new white paper about that, which is coming out, uh, which, come out, which came, came out this week. Um, we believe that uh, utilities play a vital role in orchestrating these different platforms. And what we mean by that is, uh, if we see more um, distribution and resources at the edge of the grid, around transportation, around buildings, around distribution and resources, there's a key role for the utility to orchestrate those, that we really integrate those properly into the grid, uh, and we can manage actually load across uh, the, the bigger grid as well as those adjacent platforms. Uh, we cannot end up with stranded generation assets on one hand, and distribution and resource platforms, on the other hand, that are not well uh, integrated. Um, that will be uh, a cost uh, uh, which will be very, very high for, for our society. And that's probably the biggest risk as we develop these smart cities and, and evolve our energy infrastructure. So with that, um, uh, cities have an ambitious agenda. Uh, energy infrastructure plays a key role supporting that agenda. And we're going to dive into the questions right away. This first one is for, for Pat and Hillary. Um, and I will start with Pat. Um, Pat, what does the future of sustainable infrastructure look like to your organization, PM Resources? And how do utilities best, best fit into uh, that picture? Thanks. And, and as John said, when you get to be chair of EI, you pick two priorities. One of mine is smart cities, and one is diversity. And they relate. We'll talk about that later. But the reason I pick smart cities is this is just so critical to us as we move forward to a sustainable, low-carbon environment. And what I see is utilities sort of being the integrator, platform, whatever you want to call it, for all of this technology. This is a really critical area for utilities to be involved in because someone needs to make sure that there's an open platform for all of our technology providers to connect to. And someone needs to make sure that all citizens get the benefits as we move to newer, smarter cities. There are segments of our population that we don't want to leave behind. And one of the great things that utilities do is make sure that everybody gets the benefits. One of my favorite examples is San Diego. Um, huge smart city project, great work. But one of the things they did was they helped electrify the port. You'd say, why would a utility do that? The port could afford to do it itself. Well, who got the benefits? The people that live by the port are oftentimes the low-income folks. So they got the benefit of that smart city um, piece. So it's an area where we can all play. It means a lot of different things to everybody. But this is a great place for the utilities to be in, a mid in the middle and partner with the citizens, the government, the regulators, and all of the technology providers out there. Thanks, Pat. Hillary? Yeah, no, I would agree. I think that sustainable infrastructure is really important. It's important to us as a company. Uh, we do have an 80 by 50 goal of 80% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050. And being able to invest for the future and be able to change the status quo and, and think of things differently than we have before uh, is really important and gets us closer to that goal. Uh, it's important for our customers. It's important in the states we operate in, which are Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New York. And it's also important to um, the other, you know, other parties, regulators, and uh, other parties that are in involved in our, our states. So one example of what we've done is we have, um, in the uh, island of Nantucket, we have installed, or in the process of, uh, process of installing uh, battery storage from Tesla. And just to give you an example of you know, what it took to do this, we, Nantucket is an island uh, off the coast of Massachusetts, it's 15,000 people. In the summer, it grows to 50,000 people. And we have two undersea cables that go to the island 
that provide power. Um, but if we lose one of those, it's you know, quite detrimental to the island, especially in the summer when we have this increased load. So we tried to think of different options to an old problem of how do we um, provide uh, transmission contingency on the island. So, um, so we have decided to install a four, 48 megawatt hour Tesla battery uh, to be able to provide that um, transmission contingency on the island. And, and, and would you see more of those, uh, what we call non-wire alternatives yeah. going forward as, as you design yeah. the grid for the future? Whenever we're looking at uh, what our options are, we're always thinking, you know, a portfolio of approaches and trying to balance, you know, all of those things that utilities balance in terms of reliability, affordability, um, but then also clean energy. Okay, thanks. Um, second question for you, Steve. Um, as you travel around the world, um, uh, working with different um, clients, uh, cities as well, um, share some of your stories in terms of sure. you know, how, how smart cities and um, uh, infrastructure of the future uh, converge and, and, and the role of the utility. Within. Okay. And first of all, I think you have to unpack uh, sustainability with utilities and smart cities. They're kind of like very dynamic Venn diagram depending on, um, on the venue. And they're, sort of three distinct um, highlights uh, of across the world. The first is diversity, uh, that uh, the compelling reason uh, to do a smart city, for example, uh, is different in different uh, venues in the world. Um, but the successful ones, the ones that are getting traction, have a compelling reason. And then the third point is all around the ecosystem and how you put those things together. So I'll give you a couple examples. Um, I, was, I was gonna take a poll, but I can't see the audience, so I won't do it. Um, but Busan, South Korea, um, probably many people don't know where that is. It's right on the southern um, bottom of South Korea, pointing towards Japan. Uh, about 3.5 million people. It's the largest international port uh, for South Korea. Um, and they started a smart cities uh, 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 initiative all around being uh, the safe city. And that's because they sit in Typhoon Alley. Uh, they sit right where there's a lot of earthquakes. So. Um, and they've done what you would expect, the normal implementation of all the catchword technology. So they had a large uh, video um, uh, cameras all over the city. Uh, they uh, integrated those with IoT. They actually used AI for visual recognition. They even had a blockchain implementation. So they had gotten all the catchwords. But I think one of the more interesting things that they did was they implemented a concept called citizen as a sensor. So this is all about uh, local geotagging, mobile applications, and social, where they could gather information during the disaster and, and feed that into, uh, into the city control center. Um, so that's an example that has really nothing to do with utility and actually nothing to do with sustainability, but it, was, it had a compelling region, a reason, and it was successful. I'll stay in Asia for one more uh, couple of seconds. They didn't have chips behind the ears, right, for the citizens? I'm sorry? They don't, didn't have chips behind the ears, <laughs> right? Not, not yeah. yet, right? right. It's not coming. Yet. <laughs> right. Right. Um, go to Beijing. Everyone knows Beijing has a problem. Uh, you've seen the pictures. If you've been to Beijing, you've, you've basically experienced it. Uh, the city of Beijing came to IBM, actually, IBM Research Center there. We have a research uh, facility. And they said, can you help? So basically what they implemented in terms, you know, this was a sustainability play uh, around uh, air pollution, uh, is an IoT infrastructure on steroids. Basically now there are sensors for air quality, temperature, all the sort of things you could think of uh, going into some very, very advanced analytics for forecasting. So um, now the city of Beijing, um, hyper-local forecasting uh, air quality three to five days out. Why? because the government um, will then modulate both in industrial output and transportation. You can do that in China, right? Not everywhere in the world you can do that, but in China you can definitely do that. So that's an example where the smart city and the sustainability um, kind of crossed. Uh, if you come to, uh, to the United States, it's sort of a little different story, and I think it has to do with how the ecosystems are coming together. How, are, how does the city government and utilities and regulators, how do they basically, uh, I refer to them, dance, uh, basically to create uh, a smart city environment? Um, and, but you have the same diversity. You have uh, some uh, smart city initiatives built around uh, urban development, bringing load um, to the city, bringing people to the city. Uh, I, on the negative side, I guess it's negative, I had a, a conversation recently with an executive uh, utility executive who all of a sudden became interested in smart cities because they were 
a little upset that they weren't uh, down selected in the second down select uh, to be Amazon's second headquarters. And one of the reasons they were told was because your city basically isn't um, smart enough. So this diversity, there's lots of different drivers. It's very, very localized, but if when you have a compelling driver, uh, it can be very, very successful. And we, we talked about that uh, in Europe, which more of a social movement in Europe. So Steve, where's, where's the value? Um, uh, and, and who's paying for it? Um, like, like your Asian examples, um, where mm -hmm. I guess there's not much dance going on there. Uh, somebody takes a decision to implement it. Somebody yep. is funding it. Yep. Uh, and, and is there a clear value proposition? So again, I think that is a tale of the political venue you're in. And uh, Asian cities, first of all, are, are typically much more advanced technologically, um, but they're also more um, command and control, I guess, would be the polite term. Um, so the, the cities are implementing it as an element of command control. Um, a, a generalized uh, business value uh, proposition like we might expect in, in the Western world uh, is different there. If you go to Europe, it's a social movement, right? They're, they're, they're actually paying more for things uh, because they believe in that from a social perspective. In the United States, I think it's about half and half, right? I think you, you're starting to see the vestiges of the social movement as it relates to sustainability, drive um, uh, an acceptance of paying more or marginally more, but you know, long term it probably will be cheaper. Um, and then that's part of the reason why I think it hasn't caught on fire uh, like it has in other venues. Uh, because the issue of who pays, you get, you get the lawyers involved, you know, who pays, who owns it, right, uh, who executes all those sort of factors. And we will need to figure this out in the U.S. because oh, we yeah. don't want to lose the, the race for creating smarter, s sustainable yeah. cities where, you know, I think a big driver is economic development and job creation and, and things like that. Yeah. And, and that's why I think it's a hot topic for You, you could also see, I could see cyber EI driving well this. Year, right? you know, Tom's comments yeah. about cyber, I could see cyber driving. Uh, Americans need a episodic, compelling thing usually to get things done like this, so. Sure, thanks Steve. Yep. Um, Hillary, what's, what's um, a good example of a promising innovation? I think you mentioned one, but is there another promising innovation uh, that National Grid is looking at uh, and, and has brought you know, initial success in this, yeah. in this space? Yeah, we have a, a great example. So in the city of Worcester, which is about an hour west of Boston, mm -hmm. we have a smart grid project a pilot project where we installed advanced smart meters in 15,000 uh, customer sites. And we provided digital frames and smart thermostats and um, different ways to inform the customer on what their energy use was, what were their high energy use appliances, uh, when they were using energy at certain times of the day and when it was more expensive for them. and we evaluated the success of that program and found that uh, it was really successful and something that we would like to um, replicate throughout our service area. And just some of the, the results of that work were that we had a 98% retention rate. So once people were in the program, they were quite happy and they wanted to stay in the program. Uh, close to a 70% satisfaction rate. Um, but people saved on their bills because when they saw what their energy use was and how much it was costing them in you know, very hot days with their air conditioner running, they were able to react and turn down that appliance so they could save energy. And they wound up saving almost $2 million on their bills. And uh, uh, yeah. yeah, so in the, in the pilot program for, yeah. for a year. And then also, uh, they, it was about 100 homes of power saved over the course of one year in the amount of power they saved. Was it opt-in or was it opt-out? Um, well, once they were in, they were able to leave, and so they were opting in to okay. it. Okay, yeah. very good. And, and once they were in, they were able to opt out of the That's program. That's a great example. Um, Pat, what are some of the innovations, technologies that you guys have looked at um, and, and implemented successfully in this space. Well, New Mexico is in a little different place than, than some of the other states. New Mexico is unfortunately the second poorest state um, in the nation, uh, but that said, we're lucky the average electric bill in New Mexico is only $75. So our state is more concerned about a couple things. The first thing um, is safety, public safety. So we have worked very hard with the city of Albuquerque, <coughs> excuse me, on smart street lights and LED street lights. And I think one of the things I want to communicate about the concept of a smart city is you can start incrementally. It would be great to be in Asia and have top down. It doesn't work that way here. 
So we really worked with the city on the smart street lights and making sure when we um, traded out the bulbs, we got to the high crime areas first, because it's amazing that lighting is a big, uh, big crime deterrent. So that's something we started. The other thing that um, is very uh, important to citizens of New Mexico is sustainability and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I think you all know that the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States is now the transportation sector. It's not the utility sector anymore. Um, we're greening our fleets. So we're working with our cities on you know, basic things like electric charging stations, electric buses, and helping bring those and the benefits um, to everybody because that will really help um, reduce greenhouse gases the other thing we're doing is thinking through with our cities, especially, for example, Santa Fe, many of you have been there, doesn't want to lose its character, doesn't want big electric buses rumbling down the street, and there's lots of places in Santa Fe where you can't take cars anyway. So thinking through how you put the infrastructure there for electric vehicles without ruining that historic character in Santa Fe. So we're starting in a different place and a little smaller, but I think that just shows that there's something for all of us and all cities, and just because you're not San Diego or Beijing um, doesn't mean you can't participate in this movement to help be more sustainable and to help our citizens have a better quality of life, because at the end of the day, that's, that to me is what it's all about. Whether it's lighting or pollution or you know, safety in the Tysoon, it's about having a better quality of life for our citizens, and that means different things in different cities. Thanks, Pat. Um, and, and staying with you, um, are you seeing smart cities and sustainable infrastructure as a uh, challenge, an opportunity, or a threat uh, to your current uh, business model? Um, and how does your team or your organization adapt to uh, the rate of change? It, we see smart cities as just a huge opportunity for utilities, mm -hmm. and that's why I wanted to focus it on something, because it's a place where we can engage with our customers. It's a place where we can use our skills in community relations and outreach and work with others to be that convening function to bring people together. Um, we're in Texas and we're not vertically integrated, we're in New Mexico and we are, but I think most utilities are moving to the point where generation um, will be smaller in scale, as you said, there's more distributed coming. So our action is really gonna be around our grid. So we're seeing it as, as a new, um, as a growth opportunity, as a partnership opportunity, and culturally, we have to, to make some changes. We have a lot of folks that like to plan central station generation out, and we have integrated resource plans that go out to, for 20 years to 20 decimal points, right? None of which are the skills um, that we need in this new world. So we're bringing in different folks, people with more customer skills, stakeholder skills. We are totally in the process of revamping our customer account organization with a different set of skills to deal with our customers and our communities. We've moved our government relations and our customer um, relations folks much closer together. So it's a really exciting opportunity, and I think this also is going to help give our industry uh, kind of a jump on being a great place to work, right? Smart cities, quality of life, we really bring a great product to America. And anybody that's traveled to a third world country where they don't have right, reliable, safe, affordable electricity knows how we are. And I think one of the ways that we're going to be able to appeal to the younger generation to come join us is to really talk about our mission in terms of helping people in the quality of life and helping to detract, excuse me, to attract a diverse group of employees who want to make that happen. Yeah, and you shared an interesting stat in terms of diversity. Um, what was it again? 22% uh, of the CEOs uh, of the EEI member investor-owned utilities are female, and it's less than 10% in the S&P 500. Now, we've got a way to go in the utility industry. We have a way to go in terms of ethnic diversity, but we are further ahead than the general public company um, world. Yeah, which is interesting because right. when, you, when you shared the 22%, I was like, oh, well, that's really disappointing. Yeah. But then S&P 500 is only 10%, yeah. which is, which is mind-blowing, yeah. to, to be honest. Um, Hillary, what does it do to National Grid? Is it, is, it yeah. a, is it an opportunity? Is it a threat? I think it's an opportunity. And just on, I wanted to comment quickly on the attracting a diverse um, employee base. I think that's why we talk about blockchain so much, is to look cool so people want to join <laughs> us. Yeah, that's um, right. <laughs> 
But I do think it's an opportunity, and, uh, you know, but not without challenges. So if we take the example of transportation and electrification of transportation, uh, this is a huge issue in, in the UK where we operate as well as in the US where we operate. Range anxiety continues to be a stumbling block for EV adoption. So we've been starting various initiatives to try to overcome that and um, provide either guidance or somehow participate in uh, EV charging infrastructure. So one example is in the UK. Uh, over there, we've worked with the regulator to map out where our transmission lines are and where the highways are and identify certain 50 places where those overlap so that we could do fast charging. Because you know, 50 kilowatt, you, know, you could connect that in many places, but if you're talking you know, where infrastructure is going, where EV charging is going, where 350 kilowatts and you want to string a bunch of them together, you're talking about megawatts of power that you need. So connecting to the transmis transmission system may be a solution that we can offer in the UK. Very interesting. And, and by the way, this was not a question that we agreed upon, but um, um, I, I do that all the time. Um, what about Shell? Shell is putting um, mm -hmm. uh, charging stations next to their gasoline uh, pumps yep. in London. And Shell is rolling out a fast charging infrastructure throughout Europe. Mm -hmm. um, how do you look at the oil and gas companies, specifically in Europe, and I think, I think in the US it's, it's still to come, but how, yeah. how, how does National Grid look at you know, what the oil and gas companies are doing? Are they, are they looking at, you know, I mean, they're making significant investments in you know, new energy. Is, mm -hmm. that, is, that a, is that a threat? Well, it really depends on, on where we're operating and what role we're going to play, like I said. So in some places, we are preparing the grid to be able to accept third-party charging infrastructure. Uh, in other places where maybe we haven't seen the competition quite jump in and provide those services because there's not enough money to be made uh, in third-party charging, uh, well, you know, paying for charging, that we are looking to own and operate as well. So it, it really depends on the market, but you know, for example, in the, in the UK, our regulated utility would likely be looking at um, bolstering the infrastructure and, and helping other parties decide where to... Yeah, because you guys sense. are really a grid operator in the UK and not yeah. a retailer, by the yeah, way. Yeah, and right? a Just, transmission right, operator, right, yeah. yeah. Um, so, Steve, what, what, what do you see um, with your clients around the world? Threat, opportunity? Uh, significant change in business models so, for the energy companies and utilities that you work with? All, all three. Um, some, some view this as a threat uh, personally um, or professionally. When we talk to them, we talk about it as a huge opportunity. Uh, we do see this convergence uh, issue um, emerging. It would not surprise me um, because of the capital um, required basically to do what we're talking about orchestrating over the 20 years, that you would see merger and acquisition uh, that would cross industry. That would not surprise me at all. Um, that said, uh, you know, what I refer to as the TAS scenario, transportation as a service, uh, is a tectonic move. Um, it, it impacts the automobile industry, it impacts uh, petroleum and chemicals, and it impacts um, utilities. And uh, quite frankly, you know, I, I think utilities are not being aggressive enough on it. They're starting, they're starting to embrace EVs, but EVs are just one piece of what's basically going to happen, notwithstanding the Arizona incident, uh, autonomous driving vehicles, urbanization, all those elements um, utilities are actually in, in a catbird seat in, in regard to you need a grid to do that. They, all, all, everything we're talking about converging uh, is really based on the essentiality of the grid. Uh, so um, some see it as a threat. They shouldn't. They should see it as a huge opportunity. And quite frankly, they should be more aggressive. We'll take a question from the audience in a minute here. But before um, we do that, uh, Pat, back to you. Um, um, say you're having a conversation with a uh, with a mayor or your regulator, um, and you know they're not really clear about the value of um, you know investing in a sustainable infrastructure, um, uh, supporting uh, smart city uh, projects uh, and development. Um, how, how do you convince them? How, you know what's what's the discussion like, um, and 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 what gets them to a point where they would actually see the value. Uh, over sustainable infrastructure supporting, you know, all different sorts of, of smart city projects. Yeah, it's interesting. I think sometimes mayors are easier um, to work with because when they look across, they, they want to build a business case and they look at dollars and cents, 
but they also understand those intangible benefits, right? Less pollution, more mobility for their citizens. If there's better public transportation and autonomous vehicles, people have better opportunities to work. So with the cities, it's more understanding um, what they're trying to achieve, um, who all is going to be at the table, and then you do the business case, and then they kind of do the political calculation. With the regulator, it's a little tougher. Um, you Dep know, depending on which state you're in. <laughs> we're in New Mexico, and we have elected regulators, so they're, they're going to be politicians. But no matter where a regulator is, they're appointed by a governor or a senate or something, so they have to keep that in mind. And we live in a world where, for the most part, our regulatory processes are... Right, we litigate, we're on trial, we take depositions. It's a very adversarial process because a regulator wants to make sure, rightly so, that utilities are not spending money inappropriately. But that's a, that is a process that doesn't work for this new world, and it doesn't necessarily work for this new smart city, this infrastructure. We all have, as I mentioned, integrated resource planning processes for our generation, but we don't have a process, and, and we're going to try to figure out how to have a process for this planning in terms of our distribution grid and these platforms. We're really moving to platforms or whatever you want to call it, and that's not how you regulate. So I think we need to start, and we're going to start working with our governors on how do you put together an energy plan for our state that's really not just about what kind of generation there is, although that's important, but how we take advantage of this smart grids, smart cities, and all this new technology to make quality of life better and to work on economic development. When you, mm. when you told me this morning about you know, Amazon down-selected because they're not smart enough, if cities and states <laughs> don't get on with the smartness right, or the updating of it, I'm afraid they will be left behind. So I think we're going to have to start moving those discussions to quality of life and competitiveness for the states. And it's mm. going to take a while uh, to do that. that. That sounds like a major overhaul of policy, energy policy as well as regulatory frameworks that we have today. Absolutely, and one of the things that we're doing um, at EEI along with the Smart Grid Initiative is working more on working with our regulators about best practices in state policies um, to try to help move this discussion forward, right? And there's things like in the UK with like Rio, there's other regulatory frameworks right. that are sort of a, maybe a uh, an intermediate step before we get to this, this planning step, but I think it's where we need to go as different states and different countries, and some states are there, maybe New York with REV, to make sure that all of our customers and our citizens are not left behind in this new world. Yeah. And, and I really want to go to the audience, but, okay. but two minutes on more remote urban communities, Pat. What's, what's your view? Because you know, this is not only about cities where a lot of people will live, but this is also about you know, the rest of the population that that chooses not to live in a city. Right. There's a lot of people, I mean, urbanization is happening and it will continue to happen, but there's a lot of folks that don't want to live in cities. And there are some folks that just want to be totally off the grid, but there are folks that have grown up or moved to small towns, rural cities, and they really like it. And one of the things that, that I want to work on and I'm concerned about is that those folks get the benefits of electric transportation. And in a competitive world, it may not make sense for somebody to put a charger there because they may not get the payback but we need to make sure they have it. One of the things, for example, is broadband. If you don't have broadband in rural America, you can't take advantage of telemedicine. You probably don't have a hospital in rural America. So telemedicine is your way to get treatment. Um, that's why we had a universal service fund for so long with phones, and that's why states are looking at making sure there's universal broadband. So I think one of the key roles that utilities have to play in this is because we, we have to serve everybody is to ensure that benefits go everywhere. We're not gonna, in rural America, you don't need smart building codes and you probably aren't worried about smart traffic lights because you may only have one or two. But I think when we talk about this smart cities, we need to make sure that we figure out how to get the benefits to those smaller cities and rural locations because they're not just in New Mexico, they're all over um, the United States. So that's a huge place I think utilities can play. Thanks, Pat. Um, so, Dylan, we're going to uh, a question or two from the audience. I can't, I can't see you, Dylan. Hopefully, we can hear you. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Oh. Uh, so we we uh, we've been getting a we've been getting a oh I got it cool here you go we've been getting a lot of questions on Slido so thank you everyone for doing that uh, another thing 
For one thing, if you don't know how to open Slido, it's available on the ETS Companion app. If you have that downloaded, it'll open it up for you. And Do you have a question, thing, Dilla? Sorry, here's the question. Uh, I'm Smart deployments will require a smart communications network versus the current fragmented utility communications network. How do we solve this problem? Steve, you well, want to I, take it? Well, I mean, certainly the, the um, most common answer is 5G is coming, right? Um, and certainly it's a huge opportunity for utilities. Again, maybe not in probably more issues rural since they're more or less pico cells than right. uh, in the urban space. But uh, yeah, communications is one of the cornerstones basically of implementing this, at, uh, you know, from a technology perspective. Um, anyone who is in the IoT business, which we are, this is, we love this, right? You, know, you have m more sensors, more communications. So certainly um, 5G is, is, um, is probably the future, but um, you can do a lot of uh, stuff today with the infrastructure that utilities have already um, implemented. I mean, the, the point about incrementalism is usually a bad term. In this case, I think it's good because it's not like you're just going to pop up with a smart city with all the spectrum of things at one period of time, that there are things that you can do with current infrastructure. Uh, even the example I gave in, in South Korea, they have this uh, uh, you know, video network all over the place, and they, they leveraged it by using analytics in the background that didn't re necessarily require um, uh, more advanced communication. Yeah. So, um, but uh, 5G is probably the most uh, important future um, advance. Yeah, and to add to that, by the way, in, in preparing for this session, we all agreed that the technologies are here. Um, and it's, it's really not a matter of the technologies anymore, but it's much more a matter of you know, finding business models where you can drive value to your citizens and, and customers, um, as well as shareholder value. And, and so, so it's really more about business models and then you know, regulation uh, supporting those new business models. Beth? I think about, you know, when I hear my colleague Tom Fanning talk about cybersecurity, right? Yeah. That's one of the things that keeps utility executives up at night. When you're looking at all this technology and we look at all this technology for smart cities, how do we think about keeping it secure? Because all of a sudden you have a lot more stuff, right, feeding into our grid. You guys are in the center of that. So, so. We are. Okay. Um, I mean, and you can never um, anticipate all the threats, but I mean, Tom was a little opaque. Um, a, a lot of the threat surfaces... It's because he didn't want to shoot us all. Uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> um, a lot of the... We call them threat surfaces. A lot of the threat surfaces um, we, we basically know about, right? Okay. Um, there's, uh, and I'm sure he has it actually in Atlanta, there's a there's a, a dark bunker in Atlanta that's monitoring all this, the control center for, um, for the grid. So um, a lot of the defense, a lot of the plan-oriented stuff that he was talking about uh, is in place. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not going to have a bad actor, probably a nation state, um, that's going to find um, a, a way in. Um, the other element of it is, is AI, frankly. Uh, the, uh, the, the capability of uh, artificial intelligence to look for patterns in in large, what we call corpuses of data, is something that we are implementing now for both the government and, and private institutes. So um, I don't want to say there's no possibility, but I actually think we might be a little safer than um, we may all fear. Yeah. And I'll probably get the headline after the panel where <laughs> there's some <laughs> big breach. <laughs> um, Dylan, we have another question from the audience. Uh, do utilities really have the organizational capabilities to monetize the grid and make smart, smart city growth happen? Where are the shortfalls? That was going to be my last question uh, to, um, to Pat and Hillary here. Are you guys ready? We're getting there. And I think different <laughs> utilities are in a different state of readiness. Um, I mentioned, for example, we're changing out who we hire to deal with our customers because our customers, um, for example, we're talking earlier, McDonald's just announced a big sustainability um, initiative. So we have to figure out how to work with McDonald's to make them more sustainable as opposed to just answering billing questions. We have to attract um, people that are knowledgeable about data and technology. So I think all utilities are going through in changing out a lot of their employees. And we all, for a while, worried that we had this huge amount of retirements coming up because of the age of our utility workforce. You know, it's really an opportunity for us to reboot and change who we hire. And I think that the key for all of us is as we become more diverse and more inclusive and talk about our mission, we can hire those folks. So are we there yet? Absolutely not. Do most utilities understand the challenge and are working for it? Uh, yes. 
Eloise? Yeah, I think that's true. I think mm. that they probably understand it and are moving towards it faster than people think. Yeah. Um, so we, within our own organization, we have several things going on that you know, wouldn't have happened in the not too distant past. So uh, we have a fairly large uh, data analytics team that is looking at how do we use the data we have and provide services to our customers. Uh, we have our own digital lab called NG Labs, where uh, they have everything from developing new apps to they have a, a peer-to-peer blockchain simulation that they're running in their lab so that we can understand the implications of that. And then within our new energy solutions team that does piloting of technologies, they're using design thinking techniques to come up with new solutions. So, so we're definitely moving towards a different way of thinking internally. And then externally, we're also looking at doing things differently as well with more um, performance-based incentives. Thank you very much. Um, I got 26 seconds. I want to thank the panel. Um, Fantastic insights. Uh, thank you for giving uh, specific examples, uh, a real life experience for just talking about concepts. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, uh, this discussion will continue over the next couple of years, how energy and smart cities converge further and further, how we create value to citizens, who's going to pay for it, how do we create value to all these different stakeholders, how technology can help us, and then last but not least, um, you know, how we align policies and, and the regulatory framework uh, to this new world, which just sounds like a pretty major overhaul. So uh, please welcome, uh, please help uh, join me in thanking the panel for today. And um, I'm going to hand it back to Christine. Thank you. Excellent.